morning, would you rise to your feet, turn to the people around you, give them a wave, and say hi to them. This morning, we're going to worship the Lord together, both here and in Tampines, and also those of you who are joining us at home. With God, nothing is impossible. Amen. Today, let's believe it with all our hearts as we declare that we are His praise. I can do anything, I can do all things, cause it's you who gives me strength, nothing is impossible, true you, blind eyes are open, strongholds are broken, I am leaving my faith, nothing is impossible, come on, come on to the Lord. Make a joyful noise unto Him. I'm not gonna live by what I see. I'm not gonna live by what I feel. Deep down, say it. Deep down, I know that you're here. Don't 
those who believe in Jesus, let's begin to give his name a loud praise. Shout out the name Jesus. Oh, yeah. Oh, we worship you, Lord God. And we acknowledge right here in this place that you are a way maker, miracle worker. He's a promise keeper. Amen. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. Let's worship him today with all of our heart, exalting the name of Jesus in this room. Yes, God, we acknowledge that you are here with us, moving and working in our midst today.
in the darkness. Yes, Lord. That is who you are, Lord. But the God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Amen. And you're still moving today. Because I can believe you can move any mountain with just one word. And I still believe you can heal any sickness with just one word. Touch. I still believe you can overcome fear with your perfect love. And I still believe there is freedom for all by your precious blood. Lord, I believe. See, Lord, I believe.
right here in this place, in this moment. It's moving, it's moving. There's a something you need him to do. You need a breakthrough. I believe, Lord, I believe you are working. Yes, we you are working. Yeah. 
let your spirit, Lord, be poured out, Lord. This all we ask, a fresh wind. Amen. A fresh wind from heaven. A fresh wind for a fresh season, Lord. Yes, sir. Lord, we long for you. We ask for more of your manifestation, Lord. We ask that, Lord, your presence will be here. You're not visiting us, but, Lord, we want to host you, Lord. Host you in this place that you are the master of this church, Lord. You are holding the key to all things, to our lives, Lord, to all the works of your kingdom. So, Lord, we surrender ourselves and ask that God this day, we welcome you into this place. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a praise and welcome his presence. Hallelujah. God, fall upon us, fresh wind upon your church. Holy, holy, holy. Christ is our power. Amen. Amen. Please be seated in his holy presence. A blessed morning, church, here in Woodlands and also in Tampines. What a great joy to be in church. Grace and peace be with you and your loved ones. Welcome to Lighthouse Evangelism Sunday service. And those joining us online, a warm welcome as well. If you are visiting us for the first time, would you raise your hand where you are so that our welcome team could pass you and get connected? Would you just raise your hand where you are? Tampines, we can see your hands. Would you just raise your hand? Woodlands? Are the people shy to raise their hands? Or we, Christians, children of God, are not sharing the gospel? Let's bring someone next Sunday. And if you're joining us first time as an online viewer, there is a welcome room, a virtual room at the end of the service. And if you want to have a prayer, there is a prayer team that will pray with you. Dear friends, I'm so excited to give you some family news today. First, the MCCY have eased many of the safety measures. Actually, there are only two left for us to remember that we are still a fully vaccinated service and that we must put on our masks at all times. But we can sing now with our masks on. Praise God! Now, our seating capacity has been enlarged significantly. Now we don't have to have space in between. So at Tampines with the Century and Tabernacle, and here in Woodlands, our first floor and second floor, we would be able to meet the 75% seating capacity. Amen? Now, friends, I need to get personal and close with you. The seating capacity is not an issue. And now we need to get our physical body to come back to church. We need to change our mode of thinking. We need to shift our favorite paradigm. How do we do that? Friends, we need to get down on our knees to pray for each other. Let's come back to church because we are a community of faith. We were made to worship God and we encourage one another to come back. Amen? Let's do that. You know what great timing it is for the church to open in such a large sitting capacity? My friends, we see God at work because round the corner is the Holy Week. It is the most significant event in the church calendar. From April 10 to the 17th, the church has put in a lot, a lot of work into it we pray and our desire is for each of our friends and lighter to have an experience that is transformational in this Holy Week. Beginning from Good Friday, that's Palm Sunday, where we remember our Lord and Saviour right on the humble mule. And He comes into Jerusalem triumphantly, and sometimes we always think about the triumphant, we forget that Jesus Christ came into Jerusalem to observe the Passover feast. Pastor, what's that? What's Passover? 
Some of us never had that privilege to know it. The Old Testament is very familiar with it. Jesus and his disciples are very familiar because at the upper room, that's what is recorded for us in the Gospel of Luke chapter 22. Jesus said to John and Peter, go get the Passover feast ready so that we can eat. Now, L.E. has invited the Reverend Joel Baker from down under Australia to reenact the full observation of the Passover feast. And if you have family members who are Chinese speaking, there will be a Chinese translation. Now, I need you to join by the QR code or URL link. Once you successfully register, you will be sent a list to prepare so that you can participate fully in the reenactment of the Passover feast. You can now taste the bitter pain of those children of God in slavery. You can remember the promises of God and then we can celebrate our salvation. After Palm Sunday, it is Monday Thursday, the significant day. At Monday Thursday, three things took place. Number one, Jesus washes the feet of his disciples, a servant king. Then the partaking of the Passover feast, which you must register and we can experience that together. The third, then Jesus broke bread. That's the Lord's Supper. And we're going to have many rooms prepared for you to reflect, to have your devotion. The Lord's Supper, at the foot of the cross, Jesus suffering on his road to Calvary and his victory on Resurrection Sunday. May this Good Friday be one that is transformational for us physically and spiritually. LE also celebrates our 44th anniversary. We have extended the photography competition to the 20th of April, so please send in your winning entry. Now turn your attention to the Lighthouse News. Hey Lighters! April is almost here! And do you know what is so significant? That's right! It is the month we remember Christ's death and celebrate His resurrection. At the same time, we also celebrate Lighthouse's 44th birthday. A series of events have been planned specially for you. Starting on 14 April, join us as we commemorate Passover at the Upper Light Service. Reverend Joel Baker will be speaking on the significance of the Passover. Register for this by scanning the QR code or visiting the link on the screen. Next is our Good Friday service on 15 April. Join us on site at our Woodlands or Tampany Center as we gather in remembrance of Christ's sacrifice for us. Don't miss out even if you can't attend physically. The service will also be broadcasted on our YouTube and Vimeo channels. That's not all. Starting from 15 April, we begin our first ever experiential journey to the cross. Jesus' journey to the cross is one that we've always talked about and one we certainly remember. We hope that you could join us on this journey through multiple immersive devotion rooms in reflection of what the Lord has gone through for us. The opening hours are displayed on the screen. Register your interest by scanning the QR code or by heading over to this link shown on the screen. Next, on 16th April, is Lighthouse's 44th birthday. Check out the bus on Facebook and Instagram that day and stand to win a prize if you post the most creative greeting or a fond memory you have in Lighthouse. Visit the link on the screen for more details. Finally, no better way to wrap up our celebrations than to celebrate Christ's victory on the cross. Join us in an impactful service on-site and online. There we have it! Are you excited yet? Because I am! Invite your friends and loved ones to join us! See you there!
Speed Light Youth Ministry is excited to share that we are launching our on-site youth services. Our youths will have an opportunity to be part of a larger community where they can come together to worship God, hear His Word and gather to enjoy God's presence. Our services will run on the first, second and third Sundays of every month and start at 10 a.m. We gather in the chapel in Tampines and the MPH in Woodlands. Join us and be part of our Speedlight community if you are a youth aged 13 to 18. To find out more, contact us at speedlight at lighthouse.org.sg. God is doing exciting things in the ministry and we would love for all of you to be part of it. We look forward to seeing you in our services soon. This last week's message or looking to revisit a message you have heard? Subscribe to our YouTube or Vimeo channel today. Keep up to date with us through Facebook or Instagram. What are you waiting for? Follow us on our social media platforms today. To also check out our official website at lighthouse.org.sg. Wow! Did your heart miss a beat? So many things happening. Now it's really happening for our church, isn't it? Transformation 2022. Let's pray, let's join all the activities, and let's experience God together. Now it's time for us to worship God with our gifts, with our tithes and our offerings. Let us prepare our hearts to give unto Him what He first gave unto us. Let us pray. Almighty God, loving Father, God, thank you for all these encouragements. Father, we are in a fallen world, we are weak. We are weak in the flesh. So thank you for paying attention to the little needs in our homes, in our church, in our community. Father, we just want to praise you and give you thanks. Now help us to come to this posture of gratitude and humility. Help us to remember, regardless of what we are facing, you're a good, good God. And all that we have and all that we are comes from you. So let us learn to give our first fruits, our very best, unto the Lord. And God, would you bless it. Bless it that it will multiply for the use of the extension of your kingdom, for the use of the ministry of the church. And Father, would you multiply it that it can extend to help the poor in our midst and in the world. We humbly pray and ask all of this in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, Amen. Now you can give through internet banking, check mailing, or pay now. For those in the two centres, there are offer three boxes. After the service, as you leave, it will be at the exit. Let us joyfully give unto the Lord.
It's time to listen to what God has for us this weekend. Let us quieten our hearts and welcome Senior Pastor Pacer Tan as he shares today's message. Praise God. What a wonderful name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, before we get going, would you please uh, stand with me right now and stretch out your hands. We want to welcome the Holy Spirit in this place. So lift up your hearts, lift up your hands. Friends, every time I come for church service, the thing I want the most is to encounter God. We don't just want to sing, we don't just want to hear a sermon. I believe that all of us really want to experience the fresh, fresh touch of the Lord. So as you lift up your hands, even right now, don't you sense the Holy Spirit in this place? Would you say this with me right now? Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Holy Spirit, come into my life. Holy Spirit, fill this place. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. You know, friends, this is the season that we are praying for transformation, personal change, personal transformation. And even now, for the next few moments, we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to minister to us. Are you ready? How many of you want to experience a fresh touch of the Lord Jesus Christ? Amen. How many of us want to experience the transforming work of the Holy Spirit? Can I see your hands? Come on, let's give the Lord praise in this place. Come on. Stretch out your hands to Him. And as we just sing this before the Lord, let's ask the Holy Spirit to do the work that only He can do. Amen, amen, amen. again in a few moments time and this is the season that we are saying God we want to be overcomers there is something friend in your life that you are looking for the Lord to help you to overcome doubt fear loneliness pain sin whatever it is we're gonna give it to the Lord Jesus Christ even now and we're gonna ask the Holy Spirit to enable us to overcome can I say this now Every single one of us as born again believers, we are victorious in Jesus' name. Would you give the Lord praise? Amen. So friend, I want you to commit that one thing that you are still in need of victory. I want you to think about that in a moment's time. And when we sing the chorus again, give it to the Lord. And we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to do a mighty work so that the giants in our life would be defeated. Is that okay? 
Are you ready? Come on, lift up your hands right now. Come on. Holy Spirit, by the power of your Spirit, oh God, we are overcomers. We're overcoming fear and doubt and any issues that the enemy throws at us, that we are victorious in Jesus' name. We are going to see fresh victories every single day. Our spirit is made alive. We are indeed the head and not the tail. And we're going to find fresh favor from the Lord. Oh God, be with us. We give you thanks. We're going to overcome by your spirit. And all of us say in Jesus' name, amen. Come on, give the Lord praise. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, please be seated. We are in our Overcomers series. And today we're going to talk about something that is difficult but very necessary. We're going to talk about how to overcome lust. How to overcome lust. So to put ourselves at ease, I, I want to begin by saying, you know, many times when a preacher speaks on difficult conversations, there are times when the congregation might assume that uh, the preacher has already arrived at a place of complete sanctification and holiness and godliness. And oftentimes that's not true. Uh, the preacher is... Uh, given by God, the oracles of God, to bring it forth to the church. And the preacher himself needs grace. The preacher himself needs the Spirit of God to move in his life. And you know, the, the reason why lust is not a conversation we hear much in any church is because it's one of those very embarrassing uh, topics, but we kind of understand it the minute that you know, gentlemen, we hit puberty, or even for the ladies that your body changes, we begin to understand that lust is a real thing. And so we go through that whole season of awakening, trying to figure out what lust is all about, and is it right? Is it wrong? Why does it uh, seem taboo to talk about in church? Why is it one of those things where we try not to really talk about it? And the reason is very simple. I think... Uh, deep down in the issue of lust comes to a very core part of the human being's deep desire, right? Uh, intimacy in itself is not wrong. That's why the Bible tells us to be intimate with our spouse, and also we want to have intimacy with the Holy Spirit. We want to have intimacy with God. So intimacy is something that every single human being craves for, but the issue of lust take something good like intimacy and twist it. So let's get going. What is lust, all right? 
What is lust? There's uh, many areas of lust, but we want to nail down, first of all, a simple definition. You could write this down. Lust is an overwhelming craving or desire to satisfy oneself. Now, obviously, lust doesn't just have to be sexual lust. But typically, when we speak about lust, we usually refer it to that. There's actually more aspects of lust, but it's one of the most defining understanding of lust, which is usually about sexual appetites and lust. Again, intimacy or sexual relations within a marriage covenant in itself. Uh, again, I should say marriage covenant between a man and his wife. A man and his wife. Uh, it's pleasing and glorifying before God. Anything outside of that is where the lines of God's law is being crushed. We need to stay within the lines of what God has said. So why is lust a problem? You see, all of us crave for intimacy, right? Even when I was growing up uh, as a teenager, no girlfriend, not married, obviously. Um, that was something that it was peculiar to me. And like any boy that is uh, being awakened, to their own uh, puberty and, and their body, it's, 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 a, it's a discovery, right? You're trying to discover. But there's something even deep down, even though I have not experienced intimacy when I was a young age, somehow there's a craving to, to have intimacy. It's a, it's a very natural thing, but that's where also the enemy comes many times to distort it. And do you realize that the enemy has succeeded? If you look around this world, we can't deny how much pain has come through the abuse of intimacy. You can't deny that. It's so much pain that comes. You know how many hearts are broken, how many relationships are broken, how many people's lives destroyed. Because when intimacy goes awry, and then you're going to have a lot of things like betrayal and pain and disease and, and unplanned pregnancies, uh, abortions. You're talking about a whole list of trauma emotionally, psychologically, physically, just because intimacy, a good thing, is taken in a negative. When intimacy is taken in a negative, is lust. And love is about giving, but lust is about, it's about taking. And you know what, friends? In the Bible, we see that a lot. We really do. You read the kings of men, if you read in 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, you, you see a lot of lust, even amongst God's people, even amongst royalty. Sometimes the princes of Israel, we see them filled with insatiable lust, and they abuse it. So why is lust sinful? Let's get down to this. Why is it sinful? Because we have heard culture tell us that lust is a good thing. But actually, the problem with lust, it's not about anyone else but ourselves. See, lust is not sharing an intimate experience with your spouse. Lust is about you pleasuring yourself. It doesn't matter whether anyone else, your spouse, uh, is happy. That's totally different. The act of love in an intimate uh, sexual relationship in marriage, it's not simply about you enjoying the pleasure, but rather you giving pleasure you making sure that a spouse is taken care of. See, lust is a very frightening thing. Why is it uh, sinful? The Bible will show us later on, but uh, write this down. The underlying motivation is covetousness and greed. Covetousness, you want more. You're greedy. That's the underlining thing. Um, let's look at First John 2. Verse 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Now, this is so important because if you say, Pastor, I don't understand why lust is a bad thing. Because the Bible says that it is not a part of the Heavenly Father. Uh, Heavenly Father does not lust, the Heavenly Father loves. That's why he gave his son. Um, the Heavenly Father shows what love is really all about. He's a giving, generous, gracious, merciful Father. But the problem with our sin nature is that 
we didn't have to be taught how to lust. You know what I'm saying? If you think about it, go back to your childhood, your teenage times. Go back to when maybe you first encountered the issue of lust in your life. Because I, I want to help us demystify it for a moment. First and foremost, I'm going to say a statement that I hope will help. All of us have at least in one point in our life had, had sinful lust. The issue is not whether it's still a part of you now. The issue is we look back, you would be able to identify lust in your life at a certain point. 12, 14, 16, 18. The point is when we see the, the Word of God, it explains so clearly because in our sinful flesh, there are these three areas, the lust of the flesh, it's what the flesh wants, the lust of the eyes, what we see, and the pride of life. Now, gentlemen, we understand this even more than the ladies. I'll talk about it for a moment. We understand this, right? Because many men, they are moved by the physical sight way more than ladies, way more. So if a gentleman, you see a pretty lady, the last of the eyes is a bigger danger point for all the men. It is really the case. Uh, than compared to ladies. Now, it doesn't mean that ladies cannot last with their eyes. It's just a very interesting uh, biological truth that men are really stimulated with their eyes much more. Ladies are stimulated more by their emotions, just a biological truth. So many men, some of our fight is actually how do we deal with our eyes? What goes into our eyes? What do we allow our eyes to see? Right? And of course, this is what the devil uses to tell us, right? The devil would say, you know, it's okay, just look, because that girl is pretty, and so that's fine, right? God made her, she's in, made in the image of God, and so just look. But the problem with looking is not just a casual look, admiring beauty. The problem with lust is the look turns into something that is not good. So gentlemen, I'm not here to embarrass us, but that's something we need to be aware. And that's why Job actually says that I made a covenant with God that my eyes will not look lustfully at another lady. You say, Pastor, how is that possible? We're living in this world. Everywhere we turn, there's dangers. Everywhere we turn, there could be a lady that's wearing clothing that is uh, not so, uh, it's too revealing. So what do I do, Pastor? Uh, many, many preachers I heard would say, just look down. <laughs> Actually, a better way is to look up, you know, look up to the Lord. Uh, you look down at your feet, doesn't really help, but look up, all right, look away. Because while she might be attractive to look at, the problem is, where does it lead? So your first look is not wrong. Okay, she's a pretty lady. Okay, whoa, Lord, that's a problem here. Now, my heart is trying to go there. Okay, I, I can't, Lord, help me, please. And some of you gentlemen, if you're really honest with the Spirit of God, you've been fighting this battle for many years. Today, I want to talk about how do we overcome it because this is something we really have to overcome, uh, especially the gentlemen, especially the gentlemen. We have to overcome this issue of lust. Now, the world is going to say it's okay. Right? The world is going to say it's too cruel to have just one sexual partner called your wife. The world is going to say it's all right to sow your wild oats. The world is going to say what's wrong with uh, a lot of sexual partners and all that kind of thing. And they're going to give a lot of reasons and they're going to try to make men animals. They're going to say animals do that. So aren't we also part of the animal species and therefore shouldn't we do that? The difference is the animals do not have a soul. And the animals do not have to obey God's laws. The animal doesn't read the Bible and see the Torah, but you and I do. And you and I have read enough if God's word to know that there are things that God allows and there are things that God prohibits and there's things that God wants us to move to it. You say, my pastor, lust is such a real problem in my life and why would God allow lust in my life? Actually, the better question would not be why God allowed lust in your life. Because when we were born as a sinner, a sinner will lust. A sinner will sin. 
The issue now is not, Lord, why do you allow lust in my life? You know, when I was younger and I was struggling with the issue of lust, I actually prayed this prayer. It's a crazy prayer. I said, Lord, can you just take away my sexual desire altogether? Like, make me a, you know, I don't know, man, like, you not go, but you know, like, I'm not, okay, uh, when I say you not, I don't mean <laughs> uh, uh, cutting off. I, I mean, like, just, just take away the desire. And you know why the Lord doesn't answer that prayer? He's not going to take away your sexual desire, gentlemen, or your sexual desire, ladies, because that's not how the Lord operates. He gives you these things to enjoy within what His law allows. But He wants us to fight the battles that we need to fight. Because many times, haven't you realized that you have prayed prayers and it never come to pass? I give you an example. Lord, I hate my boss. Please make my boss disappear. And then you wake up tomorrow, you still see your boss. The Lord doesn't take away many obstacles in our life because the obstacles are meant to be what we go through. We have to be able to triumph even through the trials. So your boss could be a trial in your life. Sexual temptation could be a real trial in many of our lives. And the Lord is not going to just take away the sexual desire. It doesn't work. I've, I prayed that prayer many times. It didn't work. Because that's not the Bible. There's no verse that says, come to the Lord to take away your sexual desire. Never one verse. That's not one verse. I've tried to look for it. But there are verses on what happens when we are tempted. What do we do then? When we are faced with lustful thoughts, lustful desires. Now, Brothers, sisters, let me say it again. At the underlying issue of lust, some of it is not even sin. Some of it is a, is a good desire, right? A desire to have intimacy, to feel complete, to feel satisfied. These are not bad things. Where it goes wrong is those areas that we need to deal with it at the root. Deal with it at the root. So the extremists, I've heard people say, uh, since lust is a problem, then I will never even have sexual relations with my spouse. That's not, that's not how it works. The Bible actually says, if you're burning with passion, it's better that you get married. Paul writes that. Paul says, if you're burning with sexual passion, it's so much better to get married so that you're not going to sin against God, but you can fulfill your sexual desires with your husband or your wife. So let's look at a few points here. First of all, a Christian cannot continue to live in his former lustful ways. You say, Pastor, I'm a Christian, I'm struggling. Sometimes I succeed, sometimes I fail in this area. Sometimes I find it hard to control my impulses and emotions and my desires for, for lustful thoughts. And I'm going to tell you that I hear you, I understand you, but you're going to Understand that from the heart of the Father, He wants us to be completely transformed. That's why the Bible says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed with the renewal of our mind. And you need to understand that if we really want to follow Christ, we cannot keep that old pattern of lust. Can I share with you something quite frightening to me? King Solomon, I really have no idea where he is right now. I was just doing a study uh, last month on the life of David and uh, King Saul, David, Solomon, and the kings in the Bible. And as I read the whole story of Solomon cover to cover, at the end of his life, I have no idea where Solomon is. You say, Pastor, but Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes. Um, he wrote Proverbs, much of it. He wrote some of the Psalms. It's the wisest king ever, used by God, caught by God, Right? successful king. But you know, by the end of his life, the Bible actually says that God was angry with Solomon because he was led by his many wives to worship other gods. There's no conclusion in the text to say that Solomon repented from it, turned from it. There's nothing of that sort. Hebrews 11, I don't read of Solomon in the hallmark of faith. In the New Testament, I don't read anything distinctive that says Solomon was a righteous man. I give an example. You know, when we talk about Abraham and Lot, many people speak badly about Lot. I think you need to refrain from that because the New Testament would say Lot, the nephew of Abraham, was a righteous man. 
And when you, the term a righteous man is there, you don't have to doubt it. It's in the Bible, means Lord is in heaven. There's no verse that says Solomon was a righteous man. And what is the reason? I have no idea. I hope he's in heaven, but at the tail end of his life, the last for his wives led his heart away from God. You know, the issue with lust is not just the sin. I think the issue is sin leads us away from God. I, I give an example. If I'm having victory over lust more and more, if let's say a period of time, every time a lustful thought comes and I, I say, Holy Spirit, help me, and I overcome it, and I'm in deep in prayer and, and connected with God and, and, and really finding my heart filled with the Spirit of God, those times are awesome. You feel really close with God. But those times, friends, that our hearts are filled with lust and is unbridled and uncontrolled, I want you to be really honest with the Holy Spirit. You and I are far away from God, aren't we? The Word is no longer there. Prayer, supplication, worship is, is a distant thought. And I don't say this in condemnation. I say that because sin separates us from God, and if we indulge in any sin, we are running from God. We, we don't really want God to be around because we know what He's going to say. He's going to say, son, daughter, come out from that. And then we would say to the Lord, but I can't. I like her too much. I can't. She's my Delilah. I can't. She, you know, he's too good for me. I can't, Lord. I, I can't leave this person that I love, quote unquote. Many times if you go down to the root of it, it's not love. Candidly speaking, it's lust. It's not love. You feel painful because there's connection, there's emotional ties, there's soul ties, but it's not love in the real sense of the word. And friend, like I said, at the root of it, we long for intimacy. So here's why it's so important that we have to see where the lines of intimacy should lead us to it. You know, Adam and Eve, before they sinned, they were having daily times with the Lord. The Lord walked in the cool of the garden and Adam and Eve communed with him. And the minute they sinned, what did they do? They put on their own fig leaves and they hid from the Lord. They ran. And we look at the story and say, this is so weird. No, it's not weird. It's what we do. We're Adam and Eve. We run when we sin from God. And we don't want God to be there to tell us something we really know in our hearts we've got to do. And friend, can I tell you, the longer you delay, the worse it is. The consequences are far greater. Can I tell you, as a pastor, it grieves my heart when I receive texts from uh, different ladies and, and all, the, all the stories of lust that goes uncontrolled and how men are running from their wives. Even in the church, it happens. And how only the Lord can bring love back into a marriage and a family. Can I say uh, right now, brothers, sisters, if some of you say, Pastor, lust has destroyed my home and wrecked my home, I'm going to still say there's still wonderful, glorious hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not too late as long as you're still alive. But friend, if now you are at the stage where you're seeing that lust is pulling you down, you can sense it's trying to destroy you. It's putting its, its arms around your neck to wrangle any left spiritual verve for the Lord. Now, friends, as your pastor, I've been through that season before. I wasn't always in my life a holy Christian. I've been through that season where lust choked me nearly to death. And those days, I'm not thinking of the Word of God. I'm thinking, please, Lord, don't come and tell me anything, you know, like, I know what you're going to say. That's the worst part. I know what you're going to say. But I, I want to I wanna live my own life, Lord, right? And you know what we need to do, though? I, I, I'm going to tell you very candidly. We have to come to the Lord clean and say, God, 
I have no power. Lust is killing me. Lust is taking me away from the glories of your word and intimacy with you and a proper intimacy with my husband or wife, a proper one. Lord, lust is making me not be authentically myself. I can't be truly a person that is honest and filled with integrity. And we see what happened for David even, right? When lust filled his heart. You notice that that period of time was the worst in his life. You read the stories, you know. Before that whole period of time, we're seeing David in in very magnificent ways, courageous and brave and loyal, a man full of integrity, a worshiper of God, a slayer of giants, the captain of uh, the army, a man that is so full of God, right? And the Bathsheba situation happened, and now suddenly he's a lustful man, an adulterer, a murderer. Can you imagine those nine months to one year, how far away was his heart from God? And that's one of the consequences of sin. You say, but pastor, I'm a Christian. Yes, but David was a follower of God as well. And see, that's the point though. When we stray from God, it's not like God is not gracious, but we suffer a lot. We just don't know it at that point. And David was so far from God during that period of time. And finally, of course, he's restored to the Father. But please note, there were so many consequences in David's household. In fact, the Bible says that the sword never left his house, which means there's no end to bloodshed and destruction in David's household. And that was true, if you read the stories. So back to Solomon a moment. I've not read anything in the Bible conclusively that tells me that Solomon is in heaven with God. Because lust took a hold of his heart and drew him away from God. Friends, this is one of those frightening things. You know what's the funny thing? Gentlemen, you and I are more, it's easier for us to slay Goliaths than it is to put aside Delilah's. That's the truth. When there's a battle, we say, okay, let's fight it out. Lord, give me the strength. I want to call down fire from heaven. I want to slay this Goliath. I want to walk around the walls of Jericho. And then the enemy sends, even after the conquest is done, the enemy sends a beautiful lady. And the heart is lusting after that person. Right? So that's the truth of lust. So let's look at the next one. We are caught to live by God's will, not man's will. We are caught to live by God's will, not man's will. What's man's will? Live as you please. Do as you want. Enjoy your life in the way you prescribe. But God's will is so different. God's will is so different. So you might say, but pastor, Solomon had a thousand wives. How come God allowed it? I'm not here to talk about that. I'm just here to say that isn't it a misery though if Solomon is not in heaven and he enjoyed a brief life on earth with many wives? It's true. He, had, he, did, he did enjoy. He had pleasurable times but now he's not with God. I, I don't know where he is. I do not know where he is. I think honestly, brothers, sisters, I'd rather have one spouse, you know, and make sure that I do my best by God's grace to do right by my spouse. It's really so hard, as you know, to be a good husband or a good wife, to one, let alone to a thousand. Solomon had a thousand. So we might look at it from an enjoyable standpoint, but we have to see it from an eternal standpoint. Lord, I, I, I want to have my heart set on you. The next statement I want you to write down is, man's will produces lust, but God's will produces love. This is why we need to follow the Lord. The Lord shows so much abundant love, and He shows us why it's so different. You want to know one of the remedies to destroy lust. When He calls us to love, Love will destroy lust. You say, how is that so? Many times when he asks us to love, we have no time to lust. If you're giving to the poor, you're helping the sick, you're praying for people, you're witnessing the gospel, you're doing your best to be a, a husband or wife or father or mother in a home, you're doing your best uh, not to be idle with our time. David, once he was idle, the opportunity for lust came. But if you're not idle, like 
let, let's be honest, okay? Let's talk about this for a moment. Those times when our hearts were lustful, we have to take away from other times that are useful. Isn't that so? Like, if you are deep in work and you have a lot of things to do, you really have no time to entertain lust. Because God's love leads us away from lust. When we look at what God's will is all about, many times His will is about love. Anything you read in the Bible, when He says, help the poor, when He says, help your fellow brothers and sisters, when He says, love one another, it's the opposite of lust. Lust is taking, love is giving. So let's get to the most important part. How do we overcome lust? There's three simple points, but in these three points, we have to go back home and say, Holy Spirit, help me to develop it in my spirit. So how do we overcome? The first one is uh, the most important and the most foundational. Write this down. Put to death our flesh. Put to death our flesh. You say, Pastor, it sounds strange. Not quite. Uh, the first statement that Jesus says when we're supposed to follow Him is deny ourselves. Take up the cross. Follow Him. Now, when He asks us to follow Him, He's saying, crucify your flesh which means you're no longer trying to live by the way that we used to live. We're trying to live by a higher godly calling. So the Bible was says in Colossians 3, 5, check it out, it says, Paul writes, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Check out what Paul says. He says, wow, you know, the passions of our flesh, the immorality, the impurity, the, the desires that are evil, the covetousness, these are considered as idolatry. And I hope that helps because many of us would say, but I worship Jesus. But yeah, 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 I, I do lust, I do have fleshly things. And those fleshly things, though, is showing that it's idolatry, meaning we're worshiping other gods at the same time that we worship Yahweh, at the same time when we worship Jesus, there's this double-mindedness. Solomon was the same. The Bible says he still worshiped God. He still burned the incense. He still had temple worship. He still had uh, those things. But at the same token, it also says he allowed the high places for other gods to be served and worshiped at the same token. So we can do two things and we assume that one is true. But Jesus, I worship you but our hearts could be far away because there are other idols in our life. And so we've got to put it to death. You say, Pastor, how do we put it to death? I'm going to say something radical because we've got to do it. Something really radical is literally, how do we put to death? There are literally some things you've got to kill it off totally. Like for instance, if you say, Pastor, you know, I don't want to have a lustful life, but every time I tune into social media, I can't, it's not like I choose it, it's there. Then you may need to fast from social media for a long time. You say, but pastor, I fasted for social media, it doesn't work. What should I do next? Delete your social media. Say, wow, pastor, that's really radical. Yeah. Put to death is radical. Put to death doesn't mean tolerate. Put to death means the thing must literally die. Otherwise, what happens? It resurrects in your life. What happens, pastor, when lust resurrects in my life? You will always fight this monster called lust, and many times you will lose. And again, it's back to the point, friends. When we lose, we stay away from God. We pray less. We read the Word of God less. We have no spiritual strength. We have no desire for spiritual things. Truth. Every one of us is made of the same stuff. Friends, there's no exception. You are no different from anyone else here. It's not like you can say, I can take it or leave it. I can last right now and then love next thing. I can worship other idols and then worship God. No problem, no effect, no impact, no consequence. Bah, those are lies from the enemy. And trust me, you know why I can say it? I used to believe those lies. I used to try to use those ways to justify my sin, to justify my lust and say, God, you know I love you, right? Many times, though, Jesus would want us to show him a complete love. You say, what does that mean? We shall only love the Lord thy God 
with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. The Lord is a jealous God, the Bible says in Exodus. Jealous God. He doesn't want us to be competing for His love. He doesn't want other idols to come and snuff out the love you and I have for the Lord Jesus Christ. Check out Colossians 3.16. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. We get to uh, be, write this down, build up your spiritual warfare. We've got to talk about this. Because, you know, if we don't build up our spiritual warfare, we'll keep sinking back into those things again and again. I was speaking to different brothers uh, in the, couple, uh, the last couple of months, and they were sharing their honest stories. I'm not here to tell you their stories, but these are Christian brothers like you and I, right? Christian brothers and sisters like you and I. They were sharing some of their stories of their very lustful, sinful past. And some of them, honestly, they said, Pastor, we couldn't get out of it. We couldn't get out of it. We were stuck, right? I love God, but my heart is drawn. There, there's, there's some person I, I, I want. That there's this lustful thing that I can't give up. And finally, though, many times for those that see victory, it's ultimatum time, honestly speaking. It's the Spirit coming to say, Son, this is the last hour. This is it. No more delay. And friends, when you hear that, you say, Pastor, it's so frightening. It's love. You know, when we warn our children, we warn them on serious things because we want good for their life. When the Spirit of God comes and brings warning, it's serious but it's necessary and it's love, right? Because the Spirit of God doesn't want us to go down and be destroyed. Lust destroys lives. We can be destroyed. We can go down the path of Solomon. And like I said, I don't know where Solomon is. And it's a dangerous place to be in. So let's look at what Jesus says. It's incredible. He talks about spiritual warfare. Look at what he says. Matthew 5, 28. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. No time to do a full exegesis here, but bottom line, we don't have to do an actual act of adultery to be an adulterer at heart. The intent and the thought registers to God as if we were adulterous because God is a holy God. Holiness is not just actions outward, it's also intentions inward. That's frightening stuff. So a guy could be steeped in pornography. He doesn't have a, an affair or another lover, but he's still, according to the Bible, an adulterer at heart. Now, usually one thing leads to another. It starts small, it grows bigger and bigger, bigger, right? A guy goes into soft core, goes into hard core, goes into prohibited, uh, 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 you know, sexual online activity, and then goes further and further and further and further. Typically, that's the route of sin for anything. Person takes a first drink, a second drink, gets drunk, gets drunk all the time, smokes, keeps smoking. Keep, uh, every sin keeps growing when it's left untreated or unabated. Jesus is going to say something so radical. He says, if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. Throw it away. Now, pause. You say, Pastor, after this uh, service, I need to go and see a doctor and just, <laughs> or I need to use a spoon and dig out my eye. No, wait, don't do that. He's not talking in literal gorging out your eyes, but he's saying something that is radical. He's saying that this is a stumbling block for you. This is something that is causing you to sin and sin and sin. This is going to destroy you. You got to cut it out. And you know why you cannot... Uh, deny that's the truth is Jesus' words. And the second thing is, but pastor, it's going to be painful. Exactly so. It's going to be painful because imagine your eye being gouged out. It's pain. But Jesus is talking about your spiritual. If you could gouge out that spiritual right eye, there's going to be some pain at the moment. When people lose their lovers or their lustful partners, it's painful. There's no doubt. Because at the core is intimacy but it's gone awry, right? So there's pain. So there's a pain point where you need to sever ties. In the Old Testament, we see that before. Some of the Israel men were marrying wives of other descent, other nations, and God prohibited it. And later the prophet came and said, you have to sort it out. You have to sever it. You have to cut it out. 
The pain is to sever the ties and to sever those points where we are drawn again. So for some of us, we have to do something really radical. For some of us, maybe we don't need, we can't have internet for a long time. I, I'm not here to tell you exactly what to do. Every one of us are different. For some of us, our last comes in a different way and we know where's the trigger point. We have to say, Holy Spirit, help me. I, I, I can't, I have no strength to, to pull out my eye. And Jesus, the warning is this. He says, it is better to lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. You say, Pastor, the stakes are so high, huh? Yeah. But Pastor, I said a sinner's prayer. I come to church, I tie, I, I, I'm, I'm a leader. I... But the Bible does teach us that we need to overcome. There's so many passages you can research on your own. To him who overcomes, the Bible says, I'll give him the right to eat of the tree of life. To him who overcomes, I'll give him a white stone. He will be able to sit with me. To him who overcomes. We need to overcome. We are supposed to be overcomers. And so lust can take a Christian down to the pits. Jesus' own words, not Pastor Pace's words. Jesus actually said, it's better to cut it off. Lose one of your members, your eye, your hand, than to be cast into hell. So when I hear that, and that was one of the reasons why I started my own quest to say, Lord, I need to even do something about, you know, my, my, my sin. Because it's so frightening, oh God, that I worship you on Sunday and I'm a Christian, so to speak, but I'm not gaining mastery over my life. I'm not gaining victory spiritually. And the last thing, part C, this is the most important thing as we close. Learn to be contented with what you have. The issue of lust is this insatiable desire that never ends, right? When lust hits us, it starts small, it continues to grow, and like any habit, it builds, and it builds, and it builds. The contentment part is key, though. Ladies, I'll ask you a question. You have 50,000 shoes in your house, why do you need one more? <laughs> I'm, just saying. I'm just saying, I'm not, I'm not making fun. But you know, gentlemen are the same. When uh, brothers that I know, they go into hobbies, buy one fish tank, then buy a bigger fish tank, then buy a bigger fish tank, then buy a war tank, then buy a whole aquarium. It, you know, brothers that I know, bicycle, right? Buy a cheap one, buy a affordable one, buy a better one, buy an aluminum one, buy something 9,000, never ends. Last, one thing more all the time, not enough, not satisfied. So this is the key though, if we can ask the Lord and say, God, I want to learn how to be content. And some gentlemen, let, let me say very bluntly, some of you say, but pastor, my wife is no longer young. So it's natural, right? I'm a guy, I'm lusting for a sweet young thing. That's what the world teaches though. The Bible says that, you know what the Bible says? The Bible says that you enjoy your wife. It's said in the Song of Solomon. You enjoy your wife of your youth, even to your old age. So lust robs us, friends, in so many ways. And let's look at this last verse, Hebrews 13, 5. Keep your life free from the love of money. Be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave nor forsake you. How do I close? So much i got to say, I don't have time to say it. But the contentment part is key. Let's talk about intimacy as we close. I hope this helps. At the root of lust is the desire to have intimacy. You know, I, I watched this documentary called The Twindle, uh, Tindler, Tindle Swindler. Have you, have you seen it on Netflix? Interesting. Just check it out. Basically, there's this guy that he's trying to cheat women of their money. And he pretends, right, to be a suave, handsome, rich billionaire. And he's trying to get her to be hooked, to, to, to show her love uh, at the end to kind of rob her blind. And many ladies get hooked by that. And again, before we think they are so dumb, 
the, the root of it is not nothing to do with that. The root of it is a desire to be loved, a desire to be known, a desire to be appreciated, a desire for intimacy. Just went wrong, right? That's usually how it starts. So I was watching the documentary and I was saying, wow, at the end of it, it's like, wow, this guy is getting away with this, breaking people's hearts. And the reason why this happened is many men lust for women, but many women lust for something that the guy can provide. It's in this world, friends, right? Powerful, the rich, the beautiful, it's never enough. People are not content with what they have. They need more. They need more. They need more. They need more. Can I ask you, how much more do you need to be satisfied? I've asked myself that. There's a stage in my life I was complaining and murmuring and griping, and I realized that it's nothing to do with God. It's to do with my own heart. Not satisfied, right? Lord, how do I be satisfied? You can complain to God. Lord, you see my neighbor has much more. I don't have. My neighbor has this and that I, I don't have. And as you cry out to God, the Lord is going to help in many ways. You say how. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you as we close, okay? When the Bible says, keep your love, keep your heart free from money, and then it says, be content with what you have, and then the last statement is, Jesus says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You say, Pastor, I love God. I love Jesus. That's the good start. Your love for God and your love for Christ is the place that contentment can be built. Start there. Pastor, I need intimacy, but Jesus is invisible. My wife is not invisible. My, my other lovers are not invisible. Jesus is invisible. Your lovers will die and fade. Your lovers will go into the grave. You will go into the grave. You will die. If you don't gorge out your eye and cut off your right hand, you are going to go down. It's a truth. It's a loving warning from your pastor. It's a truth. It's a loving warning, warning from Pastor Jesus. But the way to look at it is, Lord, I'm sorry for my lovers have drawn me away from you. Friend, I've done that many times to the Lord. I said, Lord, I'm sorry. I know I love you, Lord, but I don't want to be drawn anymore. I, I want to love you and not lust. I, I want to love, Right? Fill me, Lord. Because at the core of it, it's not even lust. At the core of it, it is a desire for intimacy that I should be having with you. But now it's misplaced. Friend, if you can really hear what I'm saying now, it's possible you can say, today is the day I'm going to cut off. It's painful. It's gouging on eyes and cutting off right hands. It's painful, but it's possible. Lord, I want to be content. Lord, can I start being content with you. Show you one last picture as we pray. Can Joseph in prison. Before he went to prison, Joseph was a slave and a very beautiful, sexy woman, part of his wife, was trying to get him in bed. That's lust, right? How come he didn't fall by that? Most men would fall by that, even Christian men. Truth be told. Truth be told. But how come he didn't fall by that? He had something that we need to have, friends, that intimacy with God. So even he chose not to sin and then thrown into the prison, and then the Bible says the Lord was with Joseph and the favor of God was upon him. So he's in prison for 12 years, cleaning and scrubbing the floors and the disgusting toilets, right? But he has something that no one can take from him, intimacy with God. Now, I, I tell you honestly, in the natural, Pastor Pesa, in the natural, sleeping with Potiphar's wife versus going to prison, which one sound correct? Which one sound better? In the natural, sleeping with Potiphar's wife sounds better. Joseph chose the better part. And today, maybe some of us have to put away Potiphar's wife. Put away Delilah's. Put away the Jezebel's. And say, God, it's painful, but I, to, today I choose you, Lord. I choose you. You say, I'm supposed to be your bride, and you are supposed to be my husband. 
But Lord, I'm empty. I'm lonely. I'm in despair. I'm not content. Can you please fill me again? And we're going to pray right now. Friends, I'm going to leave you with that because, you know, the last thing I want to do is to make you feel condemned. We all have deep desires in our heart. And friends, you know what? If some of us, our desires have gone off course, there's still grace available. Now, right now, there's still grace. There's still mercy available. We can put it aside and say, Lord, today I'm done. I'm, Lord, I'm done. I don't want to stray outside my marriage. I'm done, Lord. I don't want to sleep with my girlfriend anymore. I'm done, oh God. Lord, today I'm going to cut my pornographic habit. I'm done, oh God. Today I'm going to stop toying with my eyes to look at another person. Last, I'm done, oh God. But Lord, I will fail and I will fall if I really do not have genuine intimacy with you, God, because I'm not content. So with that, would you stand with me as we pray and close this service? Would you bow your heads with me right now? And I don't need you to lift up your hands because gentlemen, I understand and ladies, I understand if I said which of us are suffering from this last problem, I know it's embarrassing, but the Holy Spirit knows which of us are struggling. And please hear this from the heart of your pastor who wants to love you. Close your eyes, please. I'm not here judging anyone. I share a review that I have had my fair share of sin that the Lord had to deal with me. But hear this, please. Jesus is the greatest thing in your life. Jesus is really the husband that you need. Jesus is the true love of your soul. And today, as we cut away, cut away from our other lovers, but only cleave upon Jesus, the Lord can do marvelous things. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I pray on behalf of everyone here. Lord, you know my heart on this. I dare not and I will not condemn anyone knowing that I myself should be condemned. Lord, you could have destroyed me when I was lustful. You could have destroyed me. You could have sent me to the pit of hell. I deserve it. But Lord, you were gracious and you were patient with me. And similarly, Lord, the first prayer is, Lord, forgive us, Lord. At times when we are lusting, we think it's okay because at the core of it, we want love and intimacy. But Lord, now we know it grieves your heart. You are a jealous God. Father, forgive us, Lord. If we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us of all our sins and cleanse us of our unrighteousness. First John 1 night. Lord, so forgive us, O God. Jesus' name, amen. Second prayer, we're close. The second prayer, friends, is to overcome. Father, please help all my brothers, all my sisters, myself, to overcome this issue of lust. Oh God, at times we want to live pure and then the enemy send something in our path, throw something in the way, and then our hearts are caught up, our hearts are drawn. But Lord, remind us what is most precious as we cut off hands and cut off eyes. Remind us that you are enough. Remind us, oh God, that you will never leave us nor forsake us. Remind us, oh God, that you are the lover of our soul. And so, Lord, today we choose Jesus afresh. No other competing gods, no other idols, no other side partners, no other love affairs. We choose only the love relationship with our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Father, for this and much more, we pray for your overcoming power to help us so that each time we are tempted and potentially drawn away, Lord, you are drawing us back to the arms of marvellous grace and love. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Friends, can you say this to me one time? We are going to overcome. Say it, come on. We're going to overcome. Tell the Lord right now, I'm an overcomer of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Let's give the Lord praise. Amen. Let's go. Let us close in prayer. And I'm going to pray Martin Luther, our reformer of 100 years ago. He prayed in this way, and let's pray his prayer. Almighty God, we are yours. Help us. Almighty God, we are yours. Save us. In Jesus' name. 
now receive his blessings. Now may the grace of God Almighty, the love of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, and the wonderful fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you today and forevermore. And all God's people say, Amen. God bless you. The service is over. Next week, come and bring one more person as we worship together. God bless you. Thank you for joining us online. If you have any queries, please visit our website at lighthouse.org.sg. We hope you have been blessed. See you again next week. I worship you. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you.